What if you could take a step back and look at the world? Explore the line between certainty and doubt. Listening to the Illumination Hour with your host, Ellen Stallone. Hello and welcome everyone to another exciting episode of the Illumination Hour. Thanks so much for tuning in and downloading and listening every week. You guys are really wonderful as listeners. So today, I would like to explore the idea of bettering ourselves and bettering our lives. And I'm not just going to be speaking in general. I'm going to be talking about one specific topic, which actually is kind of an umbrella term. But I think it's really cool and fascinating. And I just want to explore the ideas surrounding it and share it with you guys because I find it interesting. So I imagine that many other people will as well. So what I'm talking about is the concept of transhumanism. I'm going to be going into things like where it started, how it developed, what it turned into, because it kind of evolved over the ages, uh, some controversies surrounding it, and potentially where it's going to be going in the future. Although, of course, we can't really know because who can predict the future, right? So, transhumanism can be defined as an international intellectual and cultural movement that affirms the possibility and desirability of fundamentally transforming the human condition by developing and making widely available technologies to eliminate aging and to greatly enhance human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacities. Which sounds pretty great! This is something that I strive for, that I hope all of you strive for as well, is just bettering myself and the people around me, not only intellectually, although that's very important, uh, but physically and psychologically. Humans have always aspired to be more than they are, to be better, to evolve into something greater, to live longer. And I think that's a worthwhile cause. Nobody likes to face the prospect of death, that they'll be separated from the people they love and the experiences that they get to have every day. No, people want to live for as long as possible. And this concept, this hope or desire is certainly not new by any means. The transhumanism desire has actually existed for about as long as we can date back into human civilization. And maybe it was termed something else back then. People didn't really think that what they were doing was, you know, something considered to be above and beyond the current human capacities. But you can sort of catch bits and pieces of the desire to rise above what we were, what we are, all throughout history. I mean, the point of transhumanism is to avoid death, to prolong life. Because death is kind of like the enemy. It destroys the continuity of of thought. It interrupts our research, our projects, things that we're learning, and takes us away from the people that we love, or the places. The questions that transhumanists generally address are something along the lines of, do we as humans accept our physical body's present limitations? Is there something better or more? Is there a reason not to make improvements? Because to me, it seems like there's nothing that should hinder us from bettering our existence as mortal beings. So... Addressing those questions is going to help us understand how people in the past sort of displayed these transhumanist efforts. Basically, it was any attempt to delay or thwart death. It's been known that for thousands of years, 
shamans and doctors would use medicines like plants to help ward off disease and death. Even the ancient tradition of the Egyptians to preserve their dead bodies was kind of an attempt to preserve them and help them into the next life, for them to make a transition from what they were in their weak corporeal existence to something better. And although usually transhumanists aim to achieve the improvement within a person's lifetime and not afterwards as in some sort of mystical belief about the afterlife, it was still a sign that people were hoping hoping or trying for something better in life. In the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh, the story is about a king that sets out on a quest for immortality. Gilgamesh learns that there exists a natural means, an herb that grows at the bottom of the sea. So he goes down to get this plant, but as he's swimming back up, a snake steals it from him before he can eat it. In later times, explorers, especially the Spanish, sought the Fountain of Youth, which was supposed to be a spring that, if you drank from it, would give you eternal life. Alchemy, which is a science dating back hundreds of years, where people tried to create gold out of things that weren't gold, or sometimes it was other things. It was basically like an early form of chemistry where people didn't really have any idea of what they were doing. They just mixed a couple things together, and hopefully they got something nice out of it. Alchemists for a while were laboring to concoct an elixir of life. Even various schools of Taoism in China strove for physical immortality through control over or harmony with natural forces. There are many examples of people striving for some answer to life extension and improvement. But for all of human existence, this answer has proved extremely elusive. But of course, it can never be as simple as that, because... No two people are searching for exactly the same answer. Sure, some people are searching for a longer life, but some people are searching for an improvement to life in various ways. Improvement can mean many different things. It can mean greater happiness in everyday living. It can mean easier access to information. Or it could be bettering choice of mates, as in changing the actual gene pool. So what I'm talking about now is eugenics, and this is kind of a dark period in the attempt at creating a better world for ourselves. I Just for the record, I think this is totally evil, and I would never recommend that anybody support eugenics in any way. But in 1923, there was a British biochemist by the name of J.B.S. Haldane, who published an essay, Daedalus, or Science in the Future, in which he argued that benefits would come from controlling our own genetics and from science in general, which is kind of a good point. He, I mean, I think that improving genetics and science is, in fact, an answer or a way to help improve our, our lives, our existence, the world around us. But Haldane predicted a wealthier society with abundant clean energy where genetics would be employed to make people taller, healthier, and smarter, which actually is getting very close to becoming true. We now do have the technology to genetically engineer even our own children, although there's a lot of uh, social issues with that, which I'll get to later. But Haldane thought that these changes would be commonplace. He also commented on what has in recent years become known as the yuck factor. The chemical or physical inventor is always a Prometheus. There is no great invention, from fire to flying, which has not been hailed as an insult to some god. But if every physical and chemical invention is blasphemy, Every biological invention is a perversion. There's hardly one which, on first being brought into the notice of an observer, 
from any nation which has not previously heard of their existence, would not appear to him as indecent and unnatural. So in the early decades of the 20th century, there were some pretty radical people that were kind of racist or right-wing ideologues uh, and some left-leaning social progressives that became concerned about the effects of medicine and social safety nets on the quality of the human gene pool. They believed that modern society enabled many unfit individuals to survive. Individuals who would have died or perished in earlier ages, and they worried that this would lead to a deterioration of the human stock, which is a horrible term. People aren't stock. People are individuals. Anyway, as a result, many countries implemented state-sponsored eugenics programs, taking the ideas of Haldane to a whole new level of perversion, which was never meant to happen. These countries included the USA, Canada, Australia, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Switzerland. Of course, these state-sponsored eugenics programs infringed on many individual rights. This went on in the United States between 1907 and 1963, during which time some 64,000 individuals were forcibly sterilized. So that's just one case where the idea of improving society through scientific means took a turn for the worst. And that, I just want to make clear, is a rarity that's not something that is likely to repeat itself in this country anyway. And that is not at all what transhumanism aims for. There was also a big interest for quite a while in the science of cryogenics, which is freezing your body, preserving it, so that at some later date you can thaw out and become reanimated. Benjamin Franklin actually wrote about wanting to be cryogenically frozen and seeing the world a hundred years from his time. Although I guess once you get into it, you can't really get out. Because as of now, we have no way of unthawing and reanimating people from these cryogenic freezers. Any attempt to would probably destroy their cells and kill them if they're not already dead. So anybody that enters into a cryogenic freezer is going to be frozen there until the time when somebody figures out how to unfreeze people and bring them back to life. Which I think that would be really cool. It'd be kind of like a form of time travel. Although not in the way that Einstein envisioned it or that science fiction displays time travel. But imagine you just get into this freezer and you fall asleep. Next thing you know... You wake up, and it's a hundred years in the future, or two hundred. Another route down which some transhumanists travel is that of artificial intelligence. So, of course, as of now, we have not achieved artificial intelligence that has reached the level of human intelligence and complexity. But that doesn't mean that we never will. Technology is always progressing at an accelerated rate, and this, every time it changes, also has a large effect on the mode of our human existence. So this kind of gives the appearance that someday we may approach an essential singularity, which at that point, human life as we know it would be altered dramatically. And it's argued even what the singularity is about. I mean, is it when computers reach our level of intelligence and surpass us? Or is it something that we can't exactly define because the implications of it are so complicated that we can't begin to comprehend with our limited brain power what it could mean? Does that mean omnipotence? Does that mean living forever? Does that mean downloading our consciousness and traveling off into space to explore interstellar regions? In any case, if a machine that was so intelligent were designed, it could then create machines that were even more intelligent than itself. After this time, there would be some sort of intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of man would be left far behind. Some say the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man will ever make. 
Maybe so. But, as I mentioned before, if humans can figure out how to scan our brains in ultra-subatomic detail and copy it onto some sort of hard drive where our brains would be the software, then we could live in the world of the internet or some sort of different plane of existence. Maybe we could live forever because of that. Our consciousness, our memories, everything being transferred over. Although that is still highly speculative because none of this has been proven or done yet, but it's always a goal or something to keep in mind. It may happen someday. Another technology that could be used in transhumanist efforts is that of nanotechnology, which recently has become kind of a big business, with worldwide research funding amounting to billions of dollars. In 1986, a man by the name of Eric Drexler published Engines of Creation, the first book-length exposition of molecular manufacturing. In this book, Drexler not only argued for the feasibility of assembler-based nanotechnology, but also explored its consequences and began charting the strategic challenges posed by its development. So, Drexler has a very progressive view of what nanotechnology could be, but not all scientists agree that non-biological molecular assemblers are possible. Who's to say what's possible, though? I mean, 300 years ago, people never thought that talking to somebody on the other side of the world in an instant would be possible, and now we all have the internet and cell phones. Like I said, who's to say what's possible, right? It could be. Someday, maybe, we'll have things built before our eyes by microscopic machines. If molecular nanotechnology could be developed as Drexler envisions it, it would have momentous ramifications. Coal and diamonds, sand and computer chips, cancer and healthy tissue. Throughout history, variations in the arrangement of atoms have distinguished the cheap from the cherished, the diseased from the healthy. Arranged one way, atoms make up soil, air, and water. Arranged another, they make up ripe strawberries. Arranged in one way, they make up homes and fresh air. Arranged in another, they make up ash and smoke. Molecular nanotechnology could help us to transform coal into diamonds or sand into computer chips. They could help us clean the pollution out of the air or remove tumors from healthy tissue. We could have nanobots swimming through our systems, acting as a primary defense system against viruses and bacteria. So there are many possibilities as to what transhumanism could be, what it could mean, in effect, in the future. Currently, people are already using such technologies as artificial organs. Things that were created in laboratories and then put into humans to serve as organs or perform some function biologically. Now that in itself is blasphemous to some people because humans are perfect the way they are. They were created by an all-knowing powerful being and we shouldn't change it. Or maybe the naysayers would comment with something like, if we use this technology and continue developing it, someday it will be out of our control, and then chaos will break loose, and we'll all end up dying from some cataclysmic event. I think that humans have a wonderful capability to imagine what their lives could be, and to constantly strive for something better. In my mind, that is what separates us from animals is that we have this beautiful characteristic of always trying and achieving and hoping that things will be better, that we can become more than we are. And I don't see what's wrong with that. I think that if anything, that is the greatest goal that people can hold is to rise above what they are, to grow into a greater being. 
Whether it's natural or artificial, I don't think it really makes a difference. Our world as it is now is already so immersed in artificial technologies. They've become such a part of our lives that we could say they're almost an extension of ourselves. Imagine trying to work or learn, achieve any task really, without things such as cell phones, laptops, the internet, vehicles. All of these things are artificial creations, but they're an extension of ourselves because they are a critical part of our life. We cannot function without them. We would be different people without these technologies that surround us. Just as the people we are today are completely different from the farmers and the workers of 300 years ago. What we do with our time, what we place value on, everything has changed. Is that bad? I don't think so. Perhaps we have become a little distanced from nature, but even that problem can be solved with the use of technology. You know, I hope that someday people do achieve things such as genetic enhancement to help us live to the age of 150. Here are some other things that are kind of related to transhumanist technologies or achievements that we already are using or are very close to using. Virtual reality, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to determine whether a donor organ is compatible with the receiver's body. Genetic engineering, which we do to food and animals because it improves the quantity of crops or it changes the food in a way that makes it more appealing to humans. Genetic engineering is also being used to destroy mosquitoes currently because they spread such deadly disease so quickly. I mean, it's questionable whether it's working or not, but it is being used. People have been eating genetically engineered food since the 80s, and now it's nearly impossible to escape any sort of genetic engineering. And that's a whole different argument as to whether that's good or bad. But right now I'm just going to say that it has greatly increased the amount of food that can be produced. Also, pharmaceuticals that improve memory, concentration, wakefulness, and mood. Some of these can be natural herbs, and some of them are indeed artificial. Performance-enhancing drugs. Cosmetic surgery, that's altering our physical appearance to be something that we naturally would not have been, which some people like. They think it's an improvement. Sex change operations. That's not natural. You're born one sex. Does that mean you have to stay that way forever? Or if you have the capability, what's wrong with changing your sex if you want to, right? You're becoming something beyond what you already were. Prosthetics. That indeed is a transhumanist technology. You can make artificial limbs out of things that are much stronger than bone and skin and tendons. Things like titanium. There are even prosthetic limbs that can now move around and be controlled by your brain, which is fascinating. I think maybe someday people are going to take the prosthetic limb thing one step further and start creating extra limbs or tails or body parts that we can't really just grow or sew onto ourselves. So that will be an interesting world when people start designing their own bodies. Anti-aging medicine. There's all sorts of creams and pills out there for it. Or closer human-computer interfaces, such as the virtual or augmented reality. These are all things that improve our existence or take us off the track of what is natural and direct us more towards what we hope for, what we dream can be. There is something to be said for being close with nature and not swaying from the path that nature has laid out for us. But at the same time, human evolution is in an early stage. Do we have to wait around for thousands of years for natural forces to act on us in a way that makes us adapt to them in order for us to change? 
Or can we change ourselves despite whatever natural forces are occurring around us? Instead of just relying on stimulus response, can we not respond and even forge our own path before stimulus shows up? I feel like that's a much more enlightened route to take, is to not wait for nature to act on us, but to be proactive and to take matters into our own hands. If we're all doomed to have a mortal existence, if we're all fated to die someday, then why not try and live in the best possible way that we can? Why not make our lives better while we still have the chance to? Or maybe it won't even be our lives. Maybe it'll be the lives of our children. But any attempt to improve the quality of life, the length of life, or the capabilities that we have while going through life, I think that's a worthwhile effort, and it's something that is ethical. I'm going to use a story to describe to you how something such as transhumanist technologies uh, like gene therapy can help people and already has been helping people lead better, healthier lives. So they're not just well, they're better than well. The story comes from yourgenome.org. It's titled Treating the Bubble Babies, Gene Therapy in Use. Some children with severe combined immunodeficiency, or SID, a genetic disorder characterized by a reduced number of immune cells, have been treated using gene therapy. Gene therapy is a medical technique first developed in 1972 that uses genes to treat or prevent disease. The first ever gene therapy trial was initiated in 1990 by Dr. William French Anderson, the patient was a four-year-old girl called Ashanti, who was suffering from a very rare disease known as severe combined immunodeficiency. In Ashanti's case, the disease was caused by the absence of the enzyme adenosine deaminase. The deficiency prevented her body from producing the white blood cells that are required to fight infections. It left her vulnerable to even the mildest of infections, resulting in symptoms such as recurrent ear or chest infection and persistent thrush in the mouth or throat. Antimicrobial drugs can be used to treat these infections in individuals with SID, but they only provide short-term benefits. Before the advent of gene therapy, there were only two ways to treat Ashanti's SID. The first was regular injections with the adenosine deaminase enzyme, which Ashanti started receiving from the age of two. Initially, she responded well and developed some resistance to infections. By the age of four, however, her health began to deteriorate, and another option was needed. The second treatment option was a bone marrow transplant from a compatible donor. Bone marrow is a spongy tissue found in the center of our bones. It produces red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells. In the case of Ashanti, a transplanted bone marrow would increase white blood cell production and give her an effective immune system with the ability to fight infection. Unfortunately, however, this option was ruled out due to the lack of compatible bone marrow donors. At that time, if neither of these treatments were possible, the only way affected children could survive was by total isolation in an artificial germ-free environment. For this reason, children with SCID were often known as bubble babies, as were popularized by Jake Gyllenhaal in the film Bubble Boy. In the early 1990s, while Ashanti's parents were desperately searching for another option for their child, permission to perform the first gene therapy trial on humans was being obtained. Scientists had already shown it was possible to insert new genes into plants and animals, but it had never been done in humans. ADA deficiency was an ideal target for the first set of gene therapy trials for a number of reasons. The effects of the disease are reversible and do not cause irreversible long-term damage in the individual. The disease results from the loss of function of a single gene. Adenosine deaminase levels vary widely in the normal population, so tight control of the introduced gene is not as important. The adenosine deaminase gene is very small and easy to manipulate in the laboratory. Also, the target cells for the therapy are lymphocytes, which are white blood cells, 
which are accessible, easy to grow, and easy to put back into the body of a patient. The final reason being that the alternative treatments are expensive and or hazardous. The process of gene therapy to treat Ashanti's condition involved getting some of Ashanti's white blood cells from her blood. Once outside of the body, new working copies of the adenosine deaminase gene were inserted into the cell via a vector. Vectors are vehicles used by scientists to insert new genes into DNA. In this case, the vector was a virus that had been modified, so it no longer caused disease. Once the functioning adenosine deaminase gene had been inserted into white blood cells by the virus, these white blood cells were injected back into Ashanti's blood. Because the white blood cells originally came from her body, there was no risk of her immune system attacking the cells. The initial impact of the gene therapy on Ashanti was amazing. Within six months of the procedure, her white blood cell count had risen to normal levels, and over the next two years, she continued to improve. Unfortunately, the effects of Ashanti's gene therapy were short-lived. Her adenosine deaminase enzyme therapy was continued during the trial so that if the gene therapy was unsuccessful, Ashanti's condition would not deteriorate too quickly. However, this made it more difficult to establish the efficacy of the gene therapy alone. To see if it had worked, they had to briefly stop Ashanti's enzyme therapy. When they did this, the symptoms of her disease returned. This meant that the gene therapy did not completely cure Ashanti's condition and she had to continue using the enzyme therapy. Further trials investigated the use of hematopoietic stem cells for treating SCID. Hematopoietic stem cells are a unique type of stem cell that are found in the body and have the ability to develop into all types of blood cells, including white blood cells. These stem cells can be reprogrammed to become white blood cells containing the adenosine deaminase gene to replace the white blood cells lacking the gene in people with Ashanti's condition. Transplanting these reprogrammed stem cells into an ADA SCID patient showed moderate success. The resulting white blood cells did produce adenosine deaminase, but only at very low levels. In 2002, there was a major breakthrough in adenosine deaminase gene therapy. This came following the development of non-myeloblative conditioning. Hematopoietic stem cells are isolated from the patient and reprogrammed to contain the adenosine deaminase gene. The bone marrow of the patient is then partially destroyed to reduce the number of ADA-deficient white blood cells in the patient. The reprogrammed hematopoietic stem cells are then transplanted back into the patient. The transplanted cells can re-establish themselves as the dominant population of white blood cells, but this time containing functioning adenosine deaminase genes. The first successful use of non-myeloblative conditioning was seen in two-year-old Palestinian child called Salsabil. Her white blood cell count, which had originally been very low, increased considerably and for some specific cells returned to normal. Importantly, the therapy was found to completely restore adenosine deaminase activity in her white blood cells, curing Salsabil of ADA SCID. Now, Salsabil is able to live a normal life. Her body is producing antibodies, and she even managed to recover from chickenpox, which would almost certainly have killed her before. As trials of this technique continue, all of the success stories were in the children that had never received adenosine deaminase enzyme therapy. Unlike the gene therapy trial with Ashanti, who continued to receive enzyme therapy during her stem cell therapy, this meant researchers were able to assess the exact effectiveness of the gene therapy on its own. This observation also suggested that enzyme therapy may have contributed to the lack of success in gene therapy trials. Currently, gene therapy is being used to treat a whole range of conditions. Some research is only in the early stages with techniques still being tested in animal models. However, the findings are promising. So gene therapy is being used to treat heart failure, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, blindness, and bone grafting. These are just a few of the potentials for this amazing technology.
Imagine how far we can take it, how many lives we can improve using this amazing advanced transhuman technology. In this next segment, I'm going to talk about two institutes that are furthering humans' efforts to become better than they are. The first institute is the National Human Genome Research Institute. They study genetics and began as the National Center for Human Genome Research, which was established in 1989 to carry out the role of the National Institute of Health in the International Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project was developed in collaboration with the United States Department of Energy and began in 1990 to help map the human genome. In 1993, it expanded its role by establishing the Division of Intramural Research to apply genome technologies to the study of specific diseases. Now, as you can imagine, many discoveries have come out of this and can help diagnose diseases in people before they're even born. Here I'm reading from their page on genome.gov about genetic enhancement. In general, Genetic enhancement refers to the transfer of genetic material intended to modify non-pathological human traits. The term commonly is used to describe efforts to make someone not just well, but better than well, by optimizing attributes or capabilities, perhaps by raising an individual from standard to peak levels of performance. When the goal is enhancement, the gene may supplement the functioning of normal genes, or may be superseded with genes that have been engineered to produce a desired enhancement. Furthermore, gene insertion may be intended to affect a single individual through somatic cell modification, or it may target the gametes, in which case the resulting effect could be passed on to succeeding generations. In a sense, the concept of genetic enhancement is not particularly recent if one considers genetic engineering drug products to alter physical traits as genetic enhancements. For example, human growth hormone, which before 1985 could be obtained only in limited quantities from cadaveric pituitary glands, now can be produced using recombinant DNA technology. When its supply was more limited, Human growth hormone was prescribed for children with short stature caused by classical growth hormone deficiency. However, with the advent of recombinant DNA manufacturing, some physicians have begun recommending use of HGH for non-hormone deficient children who are below normal height. Animal experiments to date have attempted to improve such traits as growth rate or muscle mass. Although this research is focused on developing approaches to treating human diseases and conditions, it's conceivable that developments resulting from this research could be more broadly applied to enhanced traits, rather than correct deficiencies. Recently, Schwarzenegger mice have been bred, laboratory animals whose bodies have been expanded rapidly after the injection of a gene that caused muscles to grow. The mice are the first stage in the development of treatments intended to coax the bodies of seriously ill patients with degenerating diseases to recreate damaged tissue. In the world of sports, this technology could potentially be used to improve athletic performance without being detected. Similar interventions could help delay the aging process. For example, a gene called MGF, or mechanogrowth growth factor, regulates a naturally occurring hormone produced after exercise that stimulates muscle production. Levels of MGF fall as we age, which is one reason why muscle mass is lost as we grow older. A treatment to build up muscles would allow us to remain able-bodied and independent much longer. IGF-1, another muscle-building hormone, has produced increased muscle mass in laboratory mice. Theoretically, gene insertion of IGF-1 could produce an equally impressive effect in humans. Gene transfer at the embryonic stage through a technique called pronuclear microinjection is another approach being tested in animals. However, current knowledge from animal experiments suggests that embryo gene transfer is unsafe, 
as its use results in random integration of donor DNA, a lack of control of the number of gene copies inserted, significant rearrangement of host genetic material, and a 5-10% to frequency of insertion mutagenesis. So, as of now, this technology is too dangerous to use on humans, although that's not to say that it will be forever. In addition, this technique would necessarily be followed by nuclear transfer into enucleated oocytes, a process that in at least two animal models is associated with a low birth rate and a very high rate of late pregnancy loss of newborn death. Thus, many believe that the use of gene transfer at the embryonic stage for enhancement would reach far beyond the limits of acceptable medical intervention. Greater success has been achieved in genetic enhancement of plants, which are more easily manipulated genetically and reproductively. However, the state of knowledge in humans and other complex organisms does not allow for the controlled genetic modification of even simple phenotypes. For example, in humans for whom more complex traits such as intelligence or behavior are concerned, the limitations are more pronounced. The genome provides only a blueprint for formation of the brain. The complex and subtle details of assembly and intellectual development involve more than direct genetic control and are subjected to inestimable stochastic and environmental influences. Despite the technical limitations, it is possible that eventually enhancements using techniques initially intended to restore deficiencies could be redirected to improve memory and problem solving, reduce the need for sleep, increase muscle capacity, attain desirable personality traits, protect against cardiovascular disease or cancer, or increase longevity. There are ethical concerns that come along with this, however. Genetic enhancement raises a host of ethical, legal, and social questions. What is meant by normal? When is a genetic intervention enhancing or therapeutic? How should the benefit from a genetic enhancement be calculated in comparing its risks and benefits? Would people who've been genetically engineered enjoy an unfair advantage in competing for scarce resources? That is, will genetic enhancement be available to all or only a few who can afford to purchase it using their personal finances? These questions relate to the two major concerns presented by genetic enhancement. The undermining of the principle of social equality and the problem of creating an unfair advantage that would be enjoyed by enhanced individuals. Some have speculated that genetic enhancement may affect human evolution. Philosophical and religious objections also have been raised, based on the belief that to intervene in such fundamental biological processes is playing God, or attempting to place us above God. People from various perspectives believe that any interference with the random offerings of nature is inherently wrong and question our right to toy with the product of years of natural selection. Geneticists have countered that the power to control human evolution is unlikely, as the evolution of the human species is a non-random change in allelic frequencies resulting from selective pressure. The change progresses over generations because individuals with specific patterns of alleles are favored reproductively. If new alleles were introduced by gene transfer, the impact on the species would be negligible. Moreover, there is no certainty that genetically enhanced individuals would be of greater biological fitness as measured by reproductive success. In general, however, Ethical and social concerns center not so much on the improvement of traits for alleviation of deficiencies or on the reduction of disease risk, but on the augmentation of functions that without intervention would be considered entirely normal. For some individuals, technologies that can enhance traits are even more attractive than those that would merely duplicate them. And although the distinction between cure and enhancement might be obvious to some, 
they can lose meaning in medical practice or in formulating health policy. For example, interventions that begin in an effort to cure could slide quickly towards interventions that enhance. That, I know, is a slippery slope argument, but I think that this is something that we all need to consider and think about as we move forward in the future with this advancement technology. So that was from the National Human Genome Research Institute's website, and that page was archived for historical reference purposes only. But I think that it covers the idea behind enhancement pretty well, and it makes a good case for these sort of technologies. Because, like they said, it's not always about just enhancement. Maybe it's about helping people with illness or who are incapacitated in some way to achieve what is considered a normal lifestyle. The second organization I'm going to talk about is Humanity Plus, and this is from their humanityplus.org website. Their mission is dedicated to elevating the human condition. They aim to deeply influence a new generation of thinkers who dare to envision humanity's next steps. Their program combines unique insights into the developments of emerging and speculative technologies that focus on the well-being of our species and the changes we are and will be facing. Our programs are designed to produce outcomes that can be helpful to individuals and institutions. Humanity Plus is an international nonprofit membership organization which advocates the ethical use of technology to expand human capacities. In other words, they want people to be better than well. Where does Humanity Plus advocate the ethical use of technology? Technologies that intervene with human physiology for curing disease and repairing injury have accelerated to a point in which they also can increase human performance outside the realms of what is considered to be normal for humans. These technologies are referred to as emerging and speculative and include nanotechnology, nanomedicine, biotechnology, genetic engineering, stem cell cloning, and transgenesis. Other technologies that could extend and expand human capacities outside physiology include artificial intelligence, robotics, and brain-computer integration, which form the domain of bionics and could be used for developing whole-body prosthetics. Because these technologies and their respective sciences would take the human beyond the normal state of existence, Society, including bioethicists and others who advocate the safe use of technology, have shown concern and uncertainties about the downside of these technologies and possible problematic and dangerous outcomes for our species. So what are the human capacities to be expanded? Well, the human is a biological animal, which evolved approximately 200,000 years ago as the subspecies Homo sapiens. The Western world's consensus on what is normal for human biology, lifespan, intelligence, and psychology established certain precedents. Outside those precedents would mean that a human is subnormal or beyond normal. A person who is afflicted with a physical affliction, mental condition, or degenerative disease would be considered to be outside the normal range. Likewise, a person who has increased psychological performance or cognitive ability, or lives beyond the human maximum lifespan of 120 years, would be considered outside the normal range. This determination of normal has not kept up with the advances in technology or science. Human enhancement, both therapeutic and selective, challenges the normal status and aims to expanding human capacities that furthers human physiological functions and extends the maximum lifespan. External devices such as smartphones, smartwatches, wearable biomonitors, Google Glasses, etc. are all extending human capabilities. In the field of medical technology, the cochlear implant and bionic eyes have broken through the glass ceiling on biological determinism. Regenerative medicine, stem cell therapies, smart prosthetics, genetic engineering, nanomedicine, 
cryogenics, nootropics, neuropharmacology have already done this. Daily, medicine uncovers other ways to make us better than well. People's illnesses and injuries are not only being healed, they're also being improved. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with aiming to be better than well. However, there are evident concerns, and this is where the ethical use of technology plays a part. While extending the human maximum lifespan does not cross these lines, there are other concerns that could affect humanity. Humanity Plus's focus is on the course of prompting good to great health. Many of our members practice physical fitness, participate in wellness diets, and mental fitness. Our members also participate in projects such as quantified self, entrepreneurial aims, and self-responsibility. Paying it forward and empathy is a way of life. So what is Humanity Plus's relationship to transhumanism? Humanity Plus adopted the Transhumanist Declaration. The Transhumanist Declaration was a joint effort between members of Extropy Institute, World Transhumanist Association, and other transhumanist groups worldwide. So the Transhumanist Declaration states that 1. Humanity will be radically changed by technology in the future. We foresee the feasibility of redesigning the human condition, including such parameters as the inevitability of aging, limitations on human and artificial intellects, unchosen psychology, suffering, and our confinement to the planet Earth. 2. Systematic research should be put into understanding these coming developments and their long-term consequences. 3. Transhumanists think that by being generally open and embracing new technology, we have a better chance of turning it to our advantage than if we try to ban or prohibit it. Amen! 4. Transhumanists advocate the moral right for those who so wish to use technology to extend their mental and physical capacities and to improve their control over their own lives. We seek personal growth beyond our current biological limitations. 5. In planning for the future, it is mandatory to take into account the prospect of dramatic progress in technological capabilities. It would be tragic if the potential benefits failed to materialize because of technophobia and unnecessary prohibitions. On the other hand, it would also be tragic if intelligent life went extinct because of some disaster or war involving advanced technologies. 6. We need to create forums where people can rationally debate what needs to be done and a social order where responsible decisions can be implemented. 7. Transhumanism advocates the well-being of all sentience, whether in artificial intellects, humans, post-humans, or non-human animals, and encompasses many principles of modern humanism. Transhumanism does not support any particular party, politician, or political platform. So this, to me, sounds like something that I could get behind and be supportive of. After all, I've always been interested in science fiction. Part of my interest leans towards the darker side. Things like Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, where he predicted a, a dystopian future where humans were genetically modified from the time that they were test tube babies and kept in check all throughout their lives by drugs. That's something that I have always feared and hoped to avoid, but I don't think the answer is saying no to technologies that could potentially improve our lives. I think the answer is doing the research and being responsible and learning as much as we can about these future possibilities. Someday I hope that we can all live longer, more quality lives than we do now. And it's coming. Whether we want it to or not, the technology is here. People are learning more about it each and every day. 
So the way I see it, you either have two choices. Be the stick in the mud that sticks to the old ways and don't accept the new era of technology and information and improvement in human life. Or you could take part in it and help make it better. I don't know that humans will ever achieve immortality or even being able to live until the age of 300. I don't know that humans will ever be able to download their consciousness onto a piece of machinery. I don't even know if we can unfreeze those people that have been cryogenically frozen. But who knows, maybe someday someone will make the discovery that will answer those questions. And then we'll see an alteration again in the way that our lives progress and how we interact with the world. Well, I hope this episode has given you something to think about. Thanks for listening, everyone. You can email me your comments and questions at illuminationhour at gmail.com. See you next week.